And this is David Bruce Leonard from the Earth Medicine Institute here with Sam Kaufman at the Human Path uh, Herbal Medics Academy in Taos, New Mexico. Um, this is, and we've been, I've been here for a week and it's been incredible. Tell us what you're doing here, Sam. Sure. We, uh, this is called the Home Course, uh, Herbal and Off-Grid Medical Experience. <clears throat> and it's basically a hands-on, um, 12 day immersion uh, into medicine in an austere environment that incorporates and integrates um, herbal medicine uh, with basic emergency medicine that's uh, orthodox or allopathic. Right, right. Yeah, this is just an amazing experience. We've got what, 14 students? Yeah, we have a total of 14 students. 14 students, yeah. Like at least one person auditing and kind of helping out. We have. Uh, yeah, we have, uh, let's see, three, four instructors, really, if you count my wife, Suchel, as well, for part of the Wilderness First Responder. It's divided into three three-day segments for the most part. Uh -huh. The first three-day segment is what we call the Medical Advance Party, which is, um, think of medical reconnaissance for any organization that wants to provide health care for underserved communities, whether it be in a post-disaster environment or a rural or a, a, um, you know, any kind of an austere setting where there may not be higher care at all. The second three-day portion is the Wilderness First Responder, which is the capstone for what all the students have already done, either online or on site, in three in, in two other thirds of the three thirds, basically. If you can think of it like there's the first third is Wilderness First Aid, the second third is Advanced Wilderness First Aid, and the third or the final third is Wilderness First Responder. And that we have to do on per, in person no matter what. That's just, it's Wilderness First Responder, we have to do it on site. And so that's the second three days. And then is when Dr. Pearson, MD, steps in and does his piece on um, uh, austere medicine techniques. And you've been working on, you know, suturing and wound closure and infection management. You'll be doing airway. You'll be doing chest tubes. You'll be doing austere stuff that is that is something that you can gain a lot of confidence in in a very short amount of time, uh, where you might have an emergency situation that you had to. You were the only higher care, and there and there was no other way to, to deal with things. So we kind of take it beyond the WFR. Then the WFR is always, you know, do we evac? Do we not evac? Okay, if we're going to evac, how do we get them out? And where's the higher care? And what, how do we stabilize them and prevent any further injury, or hopefully even, you know, um, help them be, become less injured or less, you know, traumatized or whatever, whether it's environmental or trauma or medical, um, and get them to higher care. And then the austere program and ask the question, well, what if there is no higher care at all? Yeah, so we've been, um, we, the, like the, Sam said, the first three days were just, you know, wilderness first responder, and it was very intense, very cool, and Dr. Pearson's here, and Sam and Dr. Pearson were both 18 Delta uh, Green Beret medics. That's and correct, yeah. Sam is a specialist in herbal medicine, He's um, and um, and he's been doing that for 30 years, and Dr. Pearson has been a surgeon for, like, since the Han Dynasty, huh? Yeah, so um, Steve came through the 18 Delta course, uh, Special Forces, aka Green Beret Medic course, about 10 years before I did. And um, then he went the Orthodox route, I think he became a paramedic, he went then from there to med school. Um, he's family practice and emergency medicine board certified, but he also, he has a lot of surgical experience. So you've, you've been an herbalist for 30 years. Yeah. And you're now an acupuncturist. That's correct, yeah. yeah. I, I got my um, doctor, or my, sorry, my master in science in, in, in acupuncture and oriental medicine. And I'm finishing up, I've got one more NCCAOM uh, board exam to do, herbology, <laughs> ironically, uh -huh. and all the other three, and, I just, I, and that's, the, of course, the easy one, really, for me, I feel like. But I've been too busy. This is just, 2023 has been insane, getting all of this brand new property ready and all the infrastructure to be able to do this course. It's been huge. And this is the first time we've done a course of this magnitude on site. Yeah, well, it's, it's going amazingly well. It really is. So I know you, you studied Chinese herbs from a scientific perspective for many years, and Western herbs and, and Chinese herbs. Yeah. And then you went to acupuncture school. What, what has been your takeaway? Because I know you're grounded in science and in Western herbalism. What's been your takeaway after acupuncture school and the whole? Yeah, so um, the takeaway, I, I've, a lot of really good things have happened, I think, by doing that experience. That experience has been wonderful because it's added a whole new paradigm, really, to medicine for me. Um, 
I'm not going to, you know, I would not extol the virtues of American acupuncture schools and how America, how <laughs> acupuncture works here because it's, you know, it's 80% needles and 20% herbs at best. Mm -hmm. big part of our program is advanced medicine making, mm -hmm. multifractional extractions, and how do we really look at what we're getting out of that herb and how do we get a full profile, constituent profile out of the herb, or mm -hmm. if that's what we're going for, or, or a part of a profile if we're not. And so I think there's a lot of tradition in Chinese medicine making that is in fantastic. It's absolutely amazing. And the, so the Materia Medica, the herbology and the, and the formula of Materia Medicas uh, that are, you know, the, the, the standard out there are just fantastic, you know. Um, so Sam and I have been discussing the possibility of having Sam do a class for Chinese medicine practitioners on the scientific applications of Chinese herbs, which is the main thing, one of the main things that's attracted me so much to what you're doing here in addition to the, you know, the survival and the austere medicine stuff. Would you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that is brilliant and I think it's um, it's really valuable and what's needed now. Sure, so I think where this goes back to is um, maybe when you go back a dozen years or even 15, 20 years, it was impossible to find really good data on any herbs that were done, that was ever done in a Western capacity. Sometimes you'd find some stuff out of European testing and labs because I feel like Europe is a little further ahead but in North America and in the United States any research that you saw done on herbs was always done with with really with the caveat that this doesn't work and when we're done we're going to tell you at best well maybe it does work but it needs a lot more research <laughs> but if you go to China or you go to India where they've been using this these you know folk medicine to TCM to you know, folk medicine to Ayurveda and you look at the the research it's done from the perspective of we know it works, it's been working for a thousand years, but how does it work? And so this is where I really found the data. And this is why I started turning to growing and, and working with, um, honestly, with TCM herbs was from that perspective. Now, I'd always been interested from an energetic perspective. I, Peter Holmes was a, probably my, one of my first herb books 30 years ago. And to this day, it's probably the only book I reference mm -hmm. on, a re on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, and I think what he did with that was fantastic. And I, I think there's... I would like to take to I would like to take that and move it to you know the next generation. I hope that would be like one of my biggest goals as a writer is to, to do that one day. But um, that you know spoke to me a lot on the energetic level. But it didn't answer these questions that I was coming at from a Western side. And so where it first really started happening was was what I call neuroregenerative or herbs that are neuroregenerative in the sense that they regenerate and support myelin sheath, you know, surrounding the nerve tissue, the nerve, the, you know, the nerve mm. cells. This became something that I found out empirically worked incredibly. Uh, I had one patient, it was kind of like the, the you know, that you kind of sometimes with herbs, I've had these like, there'll be like this doorway. There'll be like one patient where it's like, oh my God, it's just so dramatic that you know there's something there and you have to continue that. And I had this one patient that had had uh, spinal meningitis, uh, uh, sp spinal meningitis, like viral meningitis. Um, about 15 years prior, something like that, 12, 15 years prior, and it became bacterial meningitis. Wow. And she was wow. in the ICU for something like almost a year. And she, I mean, she literally, I think she coded, she died twice, like they brought her back twice. Just horrible, horrible damage, you know, to her nervous system. And um, she had had like probably a dozen years or more of misery that she'd gone from specialist to specialist to specialist, you know neurologists and so forth been diagnosed with everything from Bell's palsy to migraines to um, you know to just just trigeminal neuralgia and on, on and on and on she had never slept for something like a decade she had not ever slept more than three two or three hours at a time like wow. she'd wake up and she couldn't you know in the pain or whatever all the all the I mean it was pain at one point and that changed to just anxiety depression all these things they were just very to me seemed very obvious they were probably neuro inflammation related mm -hmm. or ner nerve damage related to the mm -hmm. meningitis and so I remember asking her you know like what have, what did your doctors do about your you know your original case of meningitis and how did they how did they look into that it's so like oh they didn't really you know they just like after about five years after they're like oh that probably doesn't play a role I'm like well of course that plays a role I mean right. it has to right I mean that kind right. of damage and so that was when I first started working I was like okay you know I've been working with these herbs that just kind of started it was again about a dozen years ago and it's like, I'd really like you to try these. And what I'd like you to try, because I've done a lot of research on um, some of these herbs uh, that were used in Ayurvedic medicine as nausea oils, right? N-A-S-Y-A, that, that is inserted through the nose. 
And there was some really good and interesting research about ashwagandha, for instance, and how it um, inserted through the nasal cavity intranasally as an oil and just kind of rubbed into the mucosa mm. and then, you know, basically going into the circulation directly uh, in that part of the body um, was turning around, was like having great success with that for like early dementia and early onset Alzheimer's patients. And so I thought, well, what if we tried that? You know, so we tried this nausea oil approach. And I, of course, I gave her some, some you know, internal formulas as well, using a lot of these neuroregenerative herbs. That were, and some of them were Chinese. Most of them are, yeah. yeah. So Acheranthes bidentata, Cornus officinalis, um, Alpinia, um, Oxyphila, not Galangia, but Alpinia, Oxyphila, where we use the, you know, we use the seed. Scutellaria? Um, no, I didn't use Scutellaria biclensis, although that absolutely, for inflammation, is a great one to put in there, for mm. sure. Now they're using injectable forms sometimes in these too, huh. uh, which I would love to get into. And in New Mexico, you can, as an acupuncturist, you can get into injectables, which I think is amazing. That's phlebotomy, really? Yeah, like uh, being able to um, get an injectable form of the herb and actually put it into the bloodstream directly. Fantastic. Yeah, that's and China does that a lot. There's a lot of that going on, right? And you have to be careful. You, know. you have to be very careful, and you have to have an injectable form in the first place. But right. yeah, that's what I love about New Mexico is you can get certification to be able to do that mm. as an acupuncturist too. So anyway, um, so your patient. So yeah, she uh, she takes a nausea oil and the, and the oral uh, form of this and goes home. And I told her, you know, hold it sublingually and let's try this and just see what happens. And she calls me like three days later and she's crying and she says, I just had I just slept for eight hours. It's the first time I've slept for eight hours in, in, in almost a decade. It's like you can't believe like how I feel today. And I was like, okay, we've hit, you know, pay dirt on this and let's, you know, so, and we continued with that and we, and we, we improved her condition vastly over the period of the next year or so, six months to a year. Uh, so that was, again, that was like one of those flagship, like, okay, my gosh, you know, this, you're onto something here, Sam, let's do this. And so as I continued, another, another uh, big aspect was uh, mitochondrial support, like mm. how can we increase, and this is something that Kyla Helms, who's another MD on our faculty, who uh, is a functional medicine doctor. And so that was um, all about, uh, you know, her working with so many people that, well, it's all the way from some of the things she was working on uh, with chronic uh, toxicity, all the way through long COVID recently, she's, you know, talked over and over about trying to support mitochondria and how much that would help. And so I started doing a lot of research on that and lo and behold, tons of Chinese herbs, a lot of them are the same neuroregenerative, by the way, that I mentioned, that are also mitochondrial supportive. So in other words, they increase mitochondrial production you know, at a cellular level in different mitochondrial cells or in different mitochondria, in different, in different cells, cells in right? the different yeah, organs. So right. like sometimes you might find an herb that works really well for cardiac mm. uh, cells and, and mitochondria and cardiac cells. And sometimes it might be for another a different organ system or just in a different organ. So uh, there is a connection there between, you know, Chinese herbs uh, being used from a Western perspective. And then deeper than that, when I started, when I was going through school and I was in a clinic, um, I remember I had a, um, an instructor who was from mainland China and she'd been an acupuncturist for, I don't know, 20 years or so and uh, was very experienced. And I remember her, I was as, as the first thing, first trimester, maybe the first term, two trimesters of our observation, right? She just observing and, you know, doing paperwork and things like that. And she was getting these patients in that were like um, perimenopausal women who have all of these, what I consider to be an epidemic. And I get them in, I would get them in my herbal clinic all the time, my student clinics. Uh, it just seems like an epidemic of men, women who are perimenopausal. They have unexplained weight loss or weight gain that they can't get rid of. Um, and they, no matter what they do, no matter how they exercise, how they eat, sometimes blood sugar issues, maybe type 2 diabetes, like early, early onset, or, or like the first stages of that, um, thyroid issues, cortisol issues, uh, just constantly this, this, this pattern. And working with Western herbs, it was always just kind of like plain whack-a-mole. It's like, oh, well, let's work on the cortisol. Okay, right, well, right, let's right. work on the thyroid. Well, let's work. And while that can be mildly successful, is by no means the, the right way, in my, in my opinion, to approach that. Well, I didn't have another answer, but this particular um, phys uh, physician slash you know, uh, teacher, acupuncturist, Dr. Tan, uh, she treated it like it was low-hanging fruit. Like, oh yeah, 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 that's easy. You know, like pulse tongue, 
you know, like, do you want to yes, like, here's, here's what we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she would be like, okay, for you, this is what we need to do. Yeah. And I started seeing these patients coming back after four weeks, six weeks, and saying, wow, you know, I'm really getting better. My blood work came back, you know, from the thyroid. My thyroid uh, hormones seemed to be more normal. And I was just like, what are you, this stuff, what are you doing, you know? And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, this is simple. This, is, this stuff's easy. I'm like, this stuff isn't easy at all. What are you talking right. about? But it is so much. It works. So I've been, I've been kind of creating this layer concept for right now where I've always had this onion layer concept in the clinic, but now I have two extra layers to it. One, the, the surface layer is what can I do for a patient that comes into the clinic that will bring them back in a week or two to say, you know what, mm, I'm feeling right. better, you know. Yeah, I'm not going to try branch. to, yeah, exactly, treat the branch. Yeah. And it's like that. This is, the, this is the key because, you know, you see a lot of Western herbal clinics, you know, they want to take like an hour and a half to two hour intake. Okay, now you're going to have to go out gluten and you're going to have to go with dairy <laughs> and sugar and you're going to have to exercise three more times a week and you're going to have, you know, and it's, it's like they walk away. Mantras, and like, right? Yeah, and it's like yeah. nobody's going to come back from that. Nobody's going to do that. And if they are, it's, you know, it's because they have so much money and time that yeah. they're just, you know, they're bored. So, you know, and we work with so many people that are either underserved or, you know, there's uh, with these different communities that each of them have their own kind of epidemiology, right? It might be because they're in a food desert. It might be because they're, you know, they're in, they're, you know, just in food desert with just, you know, uh, sugar and alcohol and, and or, you know, these, these issues around what they're actually eating. It might be because they're exposed to just a huge amount of stress. Um, we had one community that we worked with where the food that they were making, it was all homemade food, but it was so rich with dairy. This was not in this country, it was in a different country. And the women were in such a misogynistic culture. And it was just amazing how much um, the the women were treated almost just as like breeders. Like I tell you, once you can't have children anymore, you're pretty much useless to this society. Uh, closed religious community really is what it was. And you just saw the same epidemiology over and over and over again with every single woman that came into the clinic. So, you, and that was an exaggeration, but in Nicaragua one time, you know, it was just like every man that came in, like 70% of them had kidney stones. You said that, yeah, 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 right. And, right. It's, and it is an epidemic there on that part of Nicaragua. And then I talked to a doctor there and he's like, yeah, it's because they work all day in these sugarcane fields with nothing but, you know, fertilizers and, and pesticides in the water, you know, with bare feet. And they're working six days a week. Oh, and they also always had like whatever their primary arm was from the machete. They just right, had all kinds cuffs, of muscles, yeah, yeah rotator cuffs, their shoes, and so forth. So anyway, and you'd be on volcanic uh, uh, soil on one side and the ocean on the other. You know, the water is horrible. Anyway, so you're going to find an epidemiology, is my point, in every area you're in, right? Cultural um, epidemiology, I like and, to call hang it. Hang on just a second. So just to be clear, to be clear, the Human Path does remote or austere medical clinics in different places all over. We used to do them here and abroad. Now we're focused more on indigenous communities here, especially like Navajo Nation and so forth, which is part of why we moved here to Taos as well, right. uh, to be able to offer that in a local area. We stretched ourselves a little too thin going out to places like Nicaragua and Mexico and, and even out to the, you know, to like West Virginia and coal mining areas and such, because we just didn't have the, the bandwidth to be able to follow up. And you really aren't treating in any community until you can follow up. You know? Right, right, right. So yeah. here we can follow up, and that's 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 part of the, the vision here going forward as well, to be able right. to do that. So in terms of the future, so, oh, well. Oh, wait, so what I was going to oh, say, yeah. I'm sorry, was that, so then Dr. Tan, and this is back to the story of what acupuncture or what um, acupuncture and oriental medicine did for me, is that it allowed me to create this kind of layered approach to oh, where right. the, um, the symptomology on from a Western perspective, and then maybe the branch from a, from a Chinese perspective, TCM perspective, and then the deeper like functional medicine, cellular level from a Western perspective, and then the deepest to me is the energetic from a TCM perspective. Like just so, so you're really going through kind of branch, branch, you know, rhizome root or whatever. It's kind of like, it's it kind of like a lasagna. It's yeah, layered. right, lasagna, yeah, that's good. Huh. And then man, I'm telling you, this is just like, I have had I don't know if it's just timing or whatever, but since I started the teleclinic up here, we don't have the, the clinic open yet, but I have the teleclinic open. I had just had one incredibly complicated case after another, and it, it, this this process of using, um, you know, what I've learned in, in um, TCM, along with and integrating it with, so where I'll have formulas that might have some Western herbs, and I might have an entire formula that's mostly Western herbs, maybe, uh, but. I might also have a formula that's got a couple of Western herbs in it, and maybe 75% of it will be TCM herbs. 
because it's just very obvious, you know. Are you thinking spleen energetically, like yes, cheat stagnation so, absolutely. and damp so like, and all that? Yeah. Yep, yep. So we have like spleen, obvious spleen chi deficiency here, or obvious kidney indeficiency, or whatever, maybe part of it. But there's also some stuff going on here that I can absolutely treat more from a uh, symptomatic approach. That'll be very effective, you know. Mm. So, and it's interesting because then you start to see the, you know, the, the, the crossings of these. So, for instance, right around here, up, up here, we have green gentian, Frazera, um, I forget the species name, but it's, it's a different genus than green gentian, Gentiana lutea, but, um, but it is very, very similar in its medicinal, you know, taste and its medicinal qualities and everything. And uh, same family, of course, but different, different genus, different species. Ranunculaceae? Yeah, um, it doesn't matter. No, it's not. It's a Gentianus. Gentianus, yeah. 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 Frisera speciosa is the, is the, is the green gentian here. Um, Michael Moore, you know, used this, the root and the, and the leaf mm. and, and so forth. So I found that the leaf of the green gentian, for instance, is very similar to wafer ash, which is uh, trifolia, uh, or petelia trifolia, uh, trifoliata. And they're very similar except for the wafer ash is actually in the citrus family, and it has that kind of mix between citrus and berberine to it. You know, it's got that kind of bitter, but it's also got the very you know, the citrusy kind of feeling to it too. So I found that like doing a 25% orange peel, dried orange peel, with 75% green gentian gave me this very similar equivalent to wafer ash. And so, you know, that is a great one to use both as a liver support and, uh, you know, a, a collagen, but also a choleretic, and also something to just help with general you know, digestive as a bitter uh, that you can use, but it's not as cold as say, and it's, and it's descending as say using gentian, right, and, you know, right. in Chinese and TCM. And so you can take something like that that's more gradual and you can work on kind of the superficial, uh, more symptomatic uh, process. And then you can say, okay, after a week, like, let me know how you feel. You know, and be like, yeah, this is feeling a lot better. My, my whatever, my GERD is, is not affecting me now. And then you can say, okay, but, you know, we're not there at the root yet. You know, we have this issue of you know, chronic diarrhea or whatever. Just you know, chronic mm. loose stools and just never you know the fatigue. And I looked at the tongue and there's teeth marks on it and all of the things that might just send us in the direction of something like spleen chi deficiency. And so as you start to mix those two around, then there's also deeper aspects to what I'm learning about TCM. And I'm by no means. I mean, I don't have the experience that I need yet in TCM. I'm I'm not saying that I do. But as I approach it from the Western perspective, it's sort of like having a lever, you know, that you can kind of like lever to leverage that you can push to be able to get a little bit deeper into um, some aspect of a person's overall health picture. Mm. And in that process, you know, it helps you with the syndrome differentiation from a TCM standpoint, while at the same time giving you symptomatic relief from a Western standpoint. And then you can also mix in the functional medicine piece of that as well. Uh, which I think is not necessarily as deep as the TCM energetic perspective, uh, but it but it but it all fits. I mean, there's nothing. It's very rare that I'll see something where it's like, oh wow, these are like totally at odds with each other. It's mm, always exactly yeah, yeah. the opposite. They almost always dovetail into each other. Yeah. Well, there's a limited number of signs and symptoms that humans come up with, right? And then you know our patterns of of illness and health are similar all over the world. So yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, I read something when I first started in documentary school, or whatever that was, five years ago or something, um, about, I was reading some different, just texts by different um, Chinese or TCM doctors who had come over here from Taiwan or mainland China and would say something, you know, had things to say about American health. And I remember reading something by someone who was like a very experienced Taiwanese uh, neighborhood doctor. He'd been over there practicing for like 40 years or something. And he came over here and he's just like, I cannot believe all of the the um, kind of almost, uh, what did he say, like all of the layers of disease that are that are in, in America and that, <laughs> you know, that I have to try to decode coming from a TCM perspective. And I totally understand that coming from a TCM perspective. But here's the thing, I think that it doesn't work sometimes to just only have one perspective on any part of that medicine at all. Totally. You have to have different perspectives in order to get totally. you your way into exactly. that, right? Exactly, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, so we've been talking about doing a class for acupuncturists weaving into the, you know, probably people that are more experienced, but weaving these things in. Because, you know, I, I 
I, I'll use traditional formulas and then I'm always modifying them based on other pieces of data and stuff. So we're considering doing that. Um, where where are you going? In terms like, of the school? The school and your life and yeah, in terms of yeah, in terms of the, the trajectory, because this has been a this has been a trip for you and, and you know, yeah, where yeah. where where would you like to go and where yeah, you know, where do you see all this going? Yeah, I think that um, I think that this you know, having the home course here, the twelve day course, which took such an immense amount of work to put together and, and get everything ready for it, um, was kind of a good way to kind of stand on our two feet and say okay we're here you know um, I see us continuing to delve much further into austere medicine I see myself reaching out um, I have some things already planned that are that are happening that are very much I've been welcomed with open arms into some of the special operations com educational communities to where I can start to integrate herbal medicine into that special operations medicine idea um, whether it's in, from the standpoint of just college level uh, education or whether it's military level education. Um, I think we need to do some things to be able to increase our credibility for the whole wilderness first responder thing. That's an entire, um, that's an entire area that is kind of dominated by a few players that were here, that got here before everybody else. I mean, we've been doing, I've been teaching WFA for probably close to 30 years now, but but actual WFA cards and so forth, maybe for 15 years. And these folks are, this is all they do. And for us, it's like, it may not even be 5% of our, of our revenue. But, right, right, right. So it's not like it's a big thing, but I feel like I want to make sure that our credibility as a WFR provider and w, a WFR instructor level it's, stuff. It's, that's is wilderness first responder. That we need to be there completely and in the state of new mexico so there's some accreditation stuff i'd like to really work on excuse me and uh even you know accreditation around maybe gi bill eventually so there's a lot of credibility i, I credit you know it's like credibility in, in the sense that um, we can say uh, we have the recognition you yeah know, getting at, credentialed at yeah getting credentialed i think yeah. that's a big part of what we're doing next and me getting my Doctor of Oriental Medicine here in this state is a big part of that because they're treated almost like primary care here. It's a wonderful. This is a great state for acupuncture. So there's that, and then there's our clinical program, which we're branching out, in, and I'm going to open up this clinic to be a place where students can come. I've had one intern so far uh, that I've worked with up here as both in the apothecary and in the clinic, and it was a fantastic experience. Um, I'm not quite ready to really be able to, to do this full time, but at some point we'll be able to open up to where we have clin uh, students rotating in for internships as well. Cool. So you do rounds and stuff like that, clinical exactly. rounds. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have the, you know, the, we still have the family medicine program, which is all about, you know, prenatal and postpartum and pediatric, and we're going to expand that to geriatric care, uh, which has been largely Katia, but Mel Bailey is stepping in and doing a big part of that as well. Mm. And then we have the advanced medicine making the apothecarist uh, program. And that's going to continue to expand. I'm putting out more multifractional stuff. I've got a book on the way for that. Um, I'm finishing another book for story publishing, which is actually survival gardening, uh, which is away from where I want to really be writing. But uh, but that's the next one coming out. And there's the third one that I have on contract with them. None of the, those two aren't really herbal, but I have like an entire, um, at least two or three more herbal books that I want to put out that are going to be very much a unique uh, take on herbal medicine whether it's from a clinical perspective or a medicine-making perspective or a formulating perspective. Wow. No shortage of stuff to do, huh? Well, yeah, there's more than that, but I just wanted to limit <laughs> it. I want to have uh, some fiction that's been partially written that I need really? to expand out. Yeah, yeah. Kind of edutainment uh, also in the world of plant medicine as well, but oh. um, like post-apocalyptic, you know, not that far in the future maybe uh, type, type fiction that I, I'm working on. So I'd Very like cool. to I'd like to branch into that eventually because I think that's something that would be fun to do, uh, you know, creative. Like I used to be a musician and I haven't touched you know music for over 15 years, but it would be nice to do something and pull something creative back into my life. Nice, nice. Well, I'm you know I'm like as I said, this is an incredible place and this is an amazing work and um, I'm I'm going to jump into this as much as they'll put up with me in the next however many number of years and um, how can people get in touch with you 
Uh, the best way is to go to our websites. Uh, so you can go to herbalmedics.academy or thehumanpath.com or humanpath.net or you can just search my name, Sam Kaufman, C-O-F-F-M-A-N, and maybe put the word herb in there or medicine or something and it'll pop up. I have a book out called Herbal Medic. It's done real well with story publishing. It's like the third best-selling book the last couple of years. So it's, you know, my, it's, my name is out there if you just look for it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, I would highly recommend anybody who's interested in any experienced TCM practitioners or herbalists who want to have to add another perspective to their tool chest to potentiate what they're doing, but also folks interested in um, taking care of the people they love and, and austere medicine, worst case scenarios, and just being, being in the wilderness and, and learning how to take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you.